Today, we're hitting the streets of Austin to find out what people really think about sex. I like to have it. Um, Something that people do. I, I try and, and have it as much as possible. <laughs> Couples react in, in, in a sexual way before marriage, and, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, I think you find out a lot about a person through sexual experience. But I do believe that love um, is a key factor of whether or not you're going to have good sex. It's a beautiful thing. It is a natural human activity. It's something that, well, I mean, obviously we've always <laughs> done and will always mm -hmm. do. And yet we have this legacy of 18th century puritanism in this society that... Um, tells us that our bodies are wrong, our bodies are sinful, and what we do with them is wrong and sinful. I think if you're in a monogamous relationship, then your partner should, uh, you should have that discussion with your partner, that whatever you're into, and uh, they should be willing to meet you halfway or yeah. go all the way for you. I don't know, it's hard to say what, what my view might be on it uh, personally and, and isolated from, from everything because um, I, I'm, I'm so influenced by the culture around me. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad uh, that you're a part of our worship services today. We want to give a very special shout-out welcome to Shoreline South and uh, also to Shoreline West. We are so thrilled that you're a part of our church family. We're going to start off our service today with our Shoreline Creed. So if you wouldn't mind just standing to your feet, all of you out west, all of you down south, and even if you're watching at home online, come on, stand to your feet, and let's recite our Shoreline Creed together. You guys ready? All right, here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am made brand new. I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Let's give God praise for that. And you may be seated. So we are in a series on the subject of sex. And I know that for some of you, it's very difficult for you to imagine that we're even using that word, the S word, in service. And it's making you a little bit uncomfortable. You're just wondering, you know, what's this really all about? Especially if you're a first-time attender, you're probably thinking we're really, you know, kind of whacked out here. But uh, I just want you to get a little bit comfortable with the idea. We're talking about it for a couple of weeks because, you know what, our culture is talking about it. So uh, just turn to your neighbor right now to break the ice a little bit and say, I think he's going to talk about sex today. Just, just turn to him and tell him so that you can kind of get over the hump and, and, uh, and we can uh, get to the meat of what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, we have so much that I want to cover. And if you were not here last week, I really want to encourage you to get the information because we can't always go back and cover everything we talked about last week. And, uh, and you'll need some of that information uh, to make sense out of where we're going this week. But we're going to jump right in to where we left off last week. And we're going to go right back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how God originally designed the whole sexual experience to be like. Okay? And so when we go back to creation, we see that God is making the world. He said, let there be light, and it was good. He separated the land from the water, said it was good. He brought forth the trees and the vegetation. He said it was good. And it's very important in verse 24 and 25 of Genesis chapter 1, he started making all of the animals that would roam on the earth. And, uh, and the birds that would fly and the fish that would uh, be in the sea. So the whole animal kingdom is unfolding in Genesis chapter, you know, 24, uh, verse 24 and 25 of chapter 1. And then, after a pause, there is this kind of break and the pinnacle of God's creative genius unfolds on the earth. And we'll pick it up here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. It says, Then God said... Let us make human beings 
in our image, in our likeness. He made mankind in his own image. And I want to emphasize this point over and over and over again because it gets to the heart of what we're talking about in this particular series. You are not a product of Genesis chapter 1 verse 24 or verse 25. You are a product of verse 26. So important for us to understand. You are not an animal. You are a human being. In fact, I want to emphasize that so much. Go ahead and just tell your neighbor, I'm not an animal, I'm a human. Come on, just tell him. All right, just turn around and say it like this. You're not an animal, you're a human. Come on, just tell him. Fully alive, fully human. Now, we'll pick up again here in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 18. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and then closed up the place uh, with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. God made the woman out of the man. Uh, This is a, a time maybe because I still think that some of you are a little bit uncomfortable for a corny preacher joke. Just going to insert it right here. You know, when, uh, when God was making woman, he went up to Adam and said, I'm going to make you somebody so incredible, so amazing. She's going to serve you day and night. She's going to pop grapes into your mouth whenever you want them. She's going to fan your brow whenever even the slightest amount of sweat appears there. She's going to meet every single need that you have. And, uh, and Adam said, wow, that sounds great. What's going to cost me? And, uh, and the Lord said, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And then Adam said, well, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> okay, all right. That's a corny preacher joke. Just to... There's one more in this message just to whet your appetite with anticipation for what is to come. Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 24. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father... And mother, and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. That's emotional, that's spiritual, that's physical. It's talking about sexual, uh, the sexual experience right there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 And the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And so that's where we get our, our sermon title Unashamed. So, reading here from the beginning, we recognize that. Sex is God's idea. God thought of it. He designed it. And he actually put it in place before the fall. So, you know, we have this whole idea that sex is dirty, especially in the church. Uh, Our silence has, has sent a deafening message to people who live in the church and people who live in our culture that somehow sex is wrong, that sex is dirty, that sex is unhealthy. And yet we understand from God's word that he was the one who designed it. He was the one that created it. But we cannot allow our culture to define it. And that's what we have allowed to happen. We've allowed our, de- our culture to define what God has created. And in so doing, we have exchanged God's big idea of sex and we've kind of reduced it to a small idea of sex. We've taken the the beautiful expression that God has intended for the bedroom in the home and we have somehow reduced it into something that's more like a dog kennel bed. We have gone from human to animal. We've exchanged this beautiful gift of God's mystical union between a, a husband and a wife and we've reduced it to some animal impulse. But you are not an animal, you are human, the pinnacle of God's creation. I was uh, watching uh, a, uh, one of those al- animal television shows, and uh, it was showing, you know, a lion and a lioness out there in the wild, and the, you know, the hushed voice of the, uh, uh, of the person who was narrating this particular film was talking about you know, the sacred thing that was taking place between the lioness and the lion. The lion was just kind of perched up on a cliff 
And the lioness was trying to get his attention for the mating process. And I promise you, this is what it looked like. Here's the, the lion on top. And the lioness just kind of sashays her way, wiggling her backside, I promise you. And lays down in front of the male lion and just turns over on her back and just kind of lays like that. And I'm watching this, I'm amazed. And the lion doesn't even move an inch. So the lioness gets up and does it all over again, sashaying, laying on her back. Four times she had to do it to get his attention. Now I'm thinking to myself, as I'm seeing this whole thing unfold, and eventually, you know, they mate. I'm wondering, here you're seeing in the animal kingdom this kind of primal, raw expression of sexuality. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that that female lioness as she's laying on her back is thinking to herself, I wonder if he really loves me or just wants my body. She's not thinking that. She's not thinking, I wonder if I'm more committed to the relationship than he is. She's not thinking, and he's certainly not thinking, I wonder if we get together if we can really make a difference in the world. I wonder if us coming together as as husband and wife, that we can really, you know, launch new dreams and accomplish new things and make the world a better place. It's not happening. What they are actually experiencing is driven by an internal kind of DNA. It's, it's driven by, by their environment. It's in their blood. It's just them fulfilling a physical function. They're doing it by instinct. But what you understand here this morning is that we are not animals, we are human beings. And when we talk about sex, we got to elevate it from the dog kennel to the bedroom. We got to give up our cheap, small idea of sex and embrace God's big, huge idea about sex. Get rid of this kind of animal instinct and understand that in the context that God has given to us. It's a beautiful, awesome, amazing gift. Can I hear a good amen? So, there are questions, right? If God, if God designed it, and God created it, and God thought it up, there are some questions about how this beautiful experience should be experienced. You know, with whom, and in what context, and how. I have questions. You have questions. The people living in our culture have questions. In fact, every generation had questions. And even people who were following Christ in the days when the Bible were written, they had questions about it. And I want to read to you a passage of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And this is out of the Message Bible. And uh, we'll pick it up here. It says, here's Paul, and he's writing to the Corinthians. And listen how he, he starts this out. He says, now getting down to the questions that you asked in your letter to me. So here are the Corinthians. They're asking some questions. Now listen to what he says. First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? So the guys in Corinth, the gals in Corinth, they write Paul a letter and they have questions about sex. And Paul is responding to these questions. He says, First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Listen to his response. Certainly. Oh, I'm so glad that's in there. Certainly. And that's kind of a positive word, isn't it? Certainly. Positively. No doubt about it kind of a thing. But only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong. But marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. Within that passage, there are a couple of things that we can learn that is supported by other scripture verses throughout the Bible. But I just want to highlight three for us here this morning. And that is to understand how God designed sex to unfold in human relationships we got to understand these three thoughts. And the first one is that sex is exclusive to the marriage relationship. 
God designed marriage for sex and sex for marriage. That's the relationship and the context where it makes sense. I, I love a good fire. And, uh, and so when, when we moved into the house that we have out in Georgetown, uh, there were no real fireplaces. There was a, there was a couple of uh, you know, gas ones, but there wasn't a real fireplace. And I like a real fire. I, I like, you know, the wood to burn. I like to smell it. I like to see it. I like to hear, you know, the crackling of the embers. I, I just like a real fire. And, uh, and so we kind of built out there a fireplace where we could have a real fire. And uh, how many of you, you know, can agree with me here this morning that when you have a fire burning in the fireplace, man, it's, it's kind of romantic, isn't it? And, uh, and you get some good ambiance with the lighting, and uh, you get to feel the heat and the warmth of it, and it's beautiful. But we also know that the reason why we build fireplaces is because if the spark that comes out of that fireplace lands in an inappropriate place in the house, it can burn it down. As beautiful and as wonderful and as, as, as life-giving, you know, I love the fireplace because you can make s'mores. You know what? In reality, when you think about the sexual uh, idea that God had for the human race, it's kind of like a fire. It can be hot like a fire. It can be warm like a fire. It, it, it can and produce, you know, beautiful emotions like a fire. But outside of the context of the fire place, it can destroy your life. And so God has said that just like fire is for the fireplace, so sex is for marriage. If you get it outside of that context, it can really wreck your life. Let me, uh, let me give you this scripture verse here from Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 15. It says, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets and your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Drink water from your own cistern. In the, in the Bible days, the well was a very, very important um, a very important object. In fact, whole cities and towns would be built around a well. And, and if the well went bad or the well dried up, man, the, the, the city would die and they would go move somewhere else and dr- drill a different well. And there were two different types of wells uh, in Bible times. There was the public well where everybody came to, and then there was the private well that was called a cistern. Here in Proverbs, it's referring to a private well. Drink from the private well. Drink from the, 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 the well that is yours and yours alone. Don't make your private well a public well. Because there were three things that happened when your, when your well went from being a cistern that was private to being a public well that everyone had access to. Three things that happened. The water became polluted, the water became diseased, and the water dried up. So in other words, it was not pure, it was not healthy, and it was not flowing anymore. Now just think about that in the context here, because uh, the wisdom of the Word of God is saying, you know what, this sexual idea is reserved for the cistern, because why? If your cistern becomes a public well then the first casualty is it's going to become polluted. And we know in our own experience that when we have sex outside of God's design, outside of the context that He has ordained, that you know what? It comes with a whole bunch of of spiritual challenges. We feel the guilt and we feel the shame. And that's only the beginning because the next step is that it actually becomes polluted and filled with disease. And we know from our society that when people engage in sexual activity with multiple sexual partners, that one of the casualties often is our health. And there are boatloads of sexually transmitted diseases that come 
as a result of living outside of God's plan. And so not only are we spiritually facing consequences, we're also facing consequences physically and then also emotionally. Our well dries up. Uh, The whole idea of the beauty of sex just becomes something so different for us that we lose sight of God's plan. And so it's very, very important for us to understand that we got to drink from our own cistern. It wasn't like God up in heaven was saying, you know what, I want to make life really difficult on you guys, and I really want to just test your self-control. No, the reason why he said that sex is for marriage and marriage is for sex, the reason why he put that condition on it is that he knew that if your cistern becomes a public well, that you will be destroyed emotionally and spiritually and physically. And he want to preserve you from those consequences. Sex is good. Should we engage in sexual relations? Certainly, but only within the context of a marriage because God says, I have your best interest in mind. Come on, somebody give God praise. Okay, so the first thing is to understand that that sex is an exclusive Exclusive experience to marriage. The second thing that I wanted to highlight is that sex requires some wisdom and sensitivity. We live in a sex-charged culture, don't we? We live in a world where sex is being talked about everywhere, and we need to have the right perspective and the right sensitivity to the experience. Um, You know, there are lots of books out there that will tell you that there is a difference between men and women. And I'm not just talking about anatomically. There's a difference in the way women are and the way men are. And uh, and I've discovered in my journey that not only are women different from men, but women are actually different from each other. And I've also experienced in my own relationship with Laura that not only are women different from men and women different from each other, they're actually different on different days. Sometimes Laura wants me to be strong like a man, but not always. Sometimes she wants me to be soft so she can just put her head on my shoulder, but not always. Sometimes she wants to be held, but not always. Sometimes she wants to be left alone, but not always. Sometimes she wants me to be predictable and stable and dependable, but not always because sometimes she wants me to be spontaneous and do things we've never done before. But not always. Sometimes she wants me to give her money so she can go shopping. Always. (laughs) Okay, when it comes down to, to this whole idea of sex, we have to understand that it requires some wisdom and some sensitivity. All men and women have both emotional needs and physical needs. And I'm going to make a pretty broad sweeping statement here. And and I just want you to understand these are tendencies. These are not the way it is in every relationship. But um, it, it tends to be that men need physical fulfillment in order to respond emotionally. And women need emotional fulfillment in order to respond physically. So, so check this out. If you have two people in a relationship in which they're always just preoccupied with their own needs, you got the man who's just preoccupied with his physical needs, and you got the woman who's just preoccupied with their emotional needs, and they're not willing to break out of their circles and meet each other's needs, you're going to have dysfunction in your relationship. That's why marriage is all about serving each other and submitting to each other and loving each other and meeting each other's needs. And when you make investments in the relationship and kind of get out of your own circle and into the circle of someone else, that's when marriage really becomes balanced and fulfilling, especially on this dimension, the sexual dimension. So I want to talk uh, to both the men and the women for just a moment on this point. And, and, and for the women first, okay, ladies, if men need physical fulfillment in order to respond emotionally, then you, you got to understand that that's part of the way that men are wired. And so you're, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting for him to respond emotionally before you respond physically. But if he's not getting his physical needs met, it might be harder for him to respond emotionally. 
And I want to just speak this thought into your thinking, just a little bit of a hint. If sex is for marriage, and that's the only exclusive place where, for, where, where sex can be expressed, then listen to this, ladies. You are the only person that can meet your husband's needs. The only biblical way to meet your husband's need is through the wife. And I want to maybe help illustrate that here from a, Laura. Would you just come on up here? Um, just so you guys get a, an idea about this, all right? She's beautiful. She's amazing. Give Laura a good hand clap. Would you sit right here, Laura? Okay. I, I am going to tie Laura up. Okay. Just tie her up right here on stage. Okay, here she is. If I would have told you that I'm going to talk about sex and tie my wife up on stage, what would you have thought? The guys on staff, oh, you can fix it after service. Okay, this is an important point. All right. So Laura is, is, uh, is she's tied up, okay? And just pretend that Laura and I are the only two people living on planet Earth. And Laura is thirsty, but she is tied up. And I am the only person who could meet her need. Okay, so Laura, just tell everybody you're thirsty. Uh, I have a headache. I just, I, I just got a headache. I... I can't do it. Say it again. Oh, I'm just tired. I'm not in the mood, really. I'm just, just, just not in the mood. Okay, so now get mad. Let's just do it. We're play acting. Just pretend like you're mad. Dang, give me that water. <laughs> With an attitude like that, you're never going to get any water. <laughs> and, and, and then maybe I'll say, okay, here you go. Drink some water. Is anybody satisfied on that point? All right, give Laura a good hand clap. All right. You just want to stay up here, babe? <laughs> you can tell we practiced this before service. It's a last minute addition to the illustration. See, ladies, you are the only one who can meet his needs. And, and, and there's a scripture verse I found, and I've never read this before. This is absolutely amazing. Guys, you're going to love this. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 2, you guys still with me down south and out west? All right, here we go. Here is Song of Solomon, and here's the guy, and he's so excited to be meeting his girl... And he says things like, uh, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come to me. And then we pick it up here in verse 2. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. And she responds in verse 3 of chapter 5. I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I have washed my feet. Must I soil them again? Translation from the Hebrew, I've got a headache. And then, verse 6, this woman who basically turned her husband down, she finally opens up the door for my beloved. She says, but my beloved has left. He was gone, and my heart sank at his departure. And I looked for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. Now, I just want to encourage you ladies that... You are the only legitimate way for his needs to be met. And I think that's kind of an important thought just to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Now, let me talk to you men here for a moment. You guys are doing such a great job. We can just move right on, okay? We, we don't need to even... No, no, no. Here, 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 here's something for you men. We are so brain dead... That we could have a fight with our spouse and then five minutes later we can be going, hey, babe, what are you thinking? 
we got to understand just as much as we might need, you know, physical fulfillment in order to respond emotionally. They need emotional fulfillment in order to respond physically. So how about making love without any sexual connotations whatsoever? Why not express love to your spouse without an agenda to somehow later on enjoy the beauty of the beauty of physical intimacy, why don't you just express love to your spouse? Because I think real lovemaking actually starts in the kitchen. It actually starts with non-sexual touches, just hugging because you want to provide comfort or support. It, it, It involves just being sensitive to her needs emotionally. Take out the trash. Do the dishes. Help around the house. Change the diapers. Realize that if you're involved as a partner in a relationship and you start meeting practical needs and you start connecting emotionally, if you sit down and listen, even though you've heard, you know, your whole allotment of words through the business course of the day, you're still willing to sit down and talk to your spouse and listen to what she has to say. You got to break out of your mindset and get into her mindset in order for there to be unity in the relationship. And all the ladies said, it's, it's really important. And let me add a, a couple of thoughts to it too. I would encourage you to be really, really positive with your wife. Husbands, just be extremely positive. Song of Solomon chapter four. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful. That's not corny stuff. This works. Your eyes behind your veil are like doves. Your hair is like flocks of goats. Your teeth are like flocks of sheep. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your neck is like the Tower of David. I don't know how that translates into something beautiful, but apparently back in Bible days, they liked long-necked woman. But just find ways to positively reinforce the beauty of your spouse. Are you following me here today? Connect emotionally and be respectful. It's really, really important. Be respectful. You know, um, there there are some who could say that that there's a lot of freedom in the marriage bed to express, you you know, your your sexual preferences in terms of, you know, how you want to make love and all of that. But in reality... In marriage, a husband and a wife making love ought to be sensitive to each other and never force your spouse to do something that she or he doesn't want to do. Just encourage each other and love each other and be open with each other and respectful to each other. Could I hear a good amen? And just because I want you to know, Laura has never, you know, said she had a headache. She was just a nice example up here for the service. And then the third thing I wanted to share with you is that sex is a beautiful gift to be enjoyed. Again, picking up from Proverbs chapter five, rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always and may you ever be intoxicated with her love. Intoxicated, what does that mean? It actually means to be drunk. And what do you know about drunks? What do you know? They're always drinking. And when they're not drinking, they're thinking about drinking. And when they're thinking about drinking, they're making a plan to get more drinks. Be intoxicated with your wife. Be like a drunk person. Honestly, get smashed. In love with your wife. Enjoy each other. Physical intimacy was not just about procreation. It was intended for pleasure. And when I think about that, and I just want to kind of close again, some practical thoughts here. Um, You know what? Be the best that you can be for your spouse. Don't, Don't wait until after you're divorced to start working. Have you ever noticed that, that somebody goes through a relational challenge and then they get a divorce and then they decide to get in shape? 
And then they decide to, you know, to start treating people nice. And then they decide, you know, to start getting flowers and doing stuff. Why don't, it's a lot easier to do the work to keep your marriage strong than to try to, you know, recapture a flame with somebody else after your marriage has fallen apart. You know what? The best thing that you can do for your marriage is make sure the grass is so green that everyone else's grass looks brown in comparison. Be the kind of spouse that nobody in his right mind or her right mind would ever want to exchange the Rolls Royce they've got for a pair of roller skates down the street. Invest in your relationship. Now, I know that there are some people who will take that to an extreme and as people are getting older, they think they've got to do nip and tuck and do everything they can to try to keep themselves attractive. Listen, you know what? I think in a healthy relationship between two maturing adults, listen, the older we get, the more attractive we become to each other because there's something about the journey of life together. There's something about where the wrinkles and the scars of life mean something. You've been through stuff together. I mean, you, you are, you, and you're going to trade that in for just a newer, younger model that just hasn't gotten them yet. They're going to get them. Love the one you got. Invest in the relationship that you already have. And be the best you can be for for each other. You know what, ladies? You don't have to stay in your pajamas all day long. And men, listen, I know that you were made from the dirt, but that's not an excuse not to take a shower. I don't know women who like greasy hair. And, uh, and, and, and fingernails that are dirty. Come on, guys. Scope is good. Scope is godly. You say, do you have to get that practical in church? Yes, because I pray with some of you and you knock me out. Come on, guys. Get with the program. Do you, do you still love me? <laughs> So the, the Bible teaches that God designed sex, that it was his idea. He did it before the fall. It's not dirty. But you know what? If we let the culture define it, we're going to take sex from the bedroom and we're going to bring it to the dog pound. We're going to lose the uniqueness of our humanity and we're going to descend into animal impulses. We're going to give up big sex and exchange it for little sex. But in the context of what God has designed, he said, if you take this beautiful expression of fire and keep it in the fireplace, you keep it in the context of marriage, and then you learn as sincere followers of Christ to be wise and to be sensitive in your expression towards one another, and then you realize that God intended this to be a beautiful expression of delight and love. The Message Bible says, take delight in the wife of your youth. It was meant to be an enjoyable experience and that we would commit maybe even today to say, you know what, we need to, we need to connect even more because our reality in life is that we're, you know, we're pretty busy. That's our reality. And, and, and our reality is, you know, sometimes babies come onto the horizon and that separates us in terms of our sexual, sexual interaction. And, and sometimes we're busy at work and sometimes we're busy with the kids and life can be such that it actually takes us apart. And I'm challenging you to stay connected, to stay close, to enjoy the beauty of this gift. That if you ever do have to say no, you always say no with an appointment for a future date to say yes. Because this thing is pretty powerful. This, this thing called sex is a strong drive, the Bible says. But the good news is, is that marriage is even stronger to handle the beauty of it and the wonder of it, the mystery of it, the joy of it. In marriage, it's what God has intended. Could I hear a good amen? Come on, let's give God praise. And let's all of us, let's all of us pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of your wonderful plan for our lives. And Father, you have a plan for every aspect, our our spiritual lives, our physical lives, our emotional lives. And we're talking about sex. And I know when I talk about it, Father, that there are some 
who have gone through difficult experiences in their lives and they're feeling a little bit of shame and a little bit of regret. But Father, I thank you that you're a God of grace. You're a God who forgives. And I know, Lord, that when we talk about this, that there are some who, who are single and they even long for the emotional intimacy of another person and then maybe they're just feeling a little bit displaced. Father, I thank you that you can be our sovereign companion even in the midst of whatever state of relationships we have. And Father, even if we've taken sex that you designed for marriage and maybe our cistern has had you know, too much activity outside of your plan, Father, I pray that you would bring grace and forgiveness and healing and wonder and joy. You can bring us back, totally wiping clean our slates. But Father, I, I pray that you would give us wisdom and joy in this experience. In Jesus' name we pray.